Hey, hey, welcome to Film Fanatics, three film geeks discussing movies both new and old. My name is Dan. My name is Justin. And I'm Borgman. <laughs> <laughs> this week, Christopher Nolan follows up his Dark Knight conclusion with a trip to space in Interstellar. Michael Keaton rescues his career with Birdman, and we'll also review Laggies, starring Kira Knightley, Before I Go to Sleep with Nicole Kidman, and foreign thriller Borgman. Our triple feature of older films is new classic Skyfall, Joe's old classic pick Dune, and our Oscar A to Z film Anna and the King of Siam. Inspired by Skyfall, our series of the top five from the first half of this decade will look at our favorite action films. A lot of ground to cover this week, so let's get right into the new releases. We start with Interstellar, and that is with Justin. As Earth has become devastated by a food shortage, with corn as the only farmable crop remaining, ex-pilot Cooper, played by Matthew McConaughey, is recruited on a mission to find a new planet for humanity to survive, despite not knowing if or when he could ever return. Though while traveling the furthest depths of space and time, Cooper's team, as well as his grown-up daughter Murphy, played by Jessica Chastain, begins to discover things are not quite what they seem. For as much as I do take issue with director Christopher Nolan, I have to give the man credit for the level of detail he brings to it, to his current films. Interstellar is yet another technological marvel in the same likes as 2009's Inception, and I'm sure will sweep the Academy Awards for editing and sound. However, that still leaves the rest of the film, which unfortunately is not quite as impressive. At almost three hours, Interstellar takes about an hour to get moving, and within that time, no one decides to cram in a heavy environmentalist undertone, as well as completely unnecessary documentary-like intercuts to illustrate the state of the world. However, once Chastain gets introduced to the film, about midway through the second act, Interstellar starts to pick up, getting more involved with what's going on and where the film is heading next. Unfortunately, no one seems to care far more about paying homage to other significantly better films such as 2001 A Space Odyssey instead of doing something actually original. Alongside this, the twist no one has thrown in is obvious and leads to a conclusion that just doesn't quite make much sense. In the end, Interstellar is a beautiful film worth a viewing for the technical side of things, but ultimately tries to be smarter than it actually is, and I give it a B. All right, Joe, let's hear from you about Interstellar. <clears throat> Interstellar. I can understand why people may like Christopher Nolan's style of filmmaking. He has really grand scope. He can offer you a true cinematic experience, bombastic scores, crisp camera work, great actors lining up your cast. These are Nolan's strengths. However, he tries to tackle these grand metaphysical and, dare I say, surrealist ideas in his films, particularly lately. This was true with The Prestige, Inception, the Batman movies, and now with Interstellar. While Tarantino has left his close-knit films and amped up to the ap epic status, and is arguably as good as he ever was, I feel Nolan is just starting to fall into his own traps. Like his last several films, Interstellar has a really cool concept and an amazing look. I can't deny that. Matthew McConaughey does a fantastic job, as he almost always does. However, nearly every other character in the movie is either unlikable or simply forgettable. How can McConaughey's character be expected to thrive when virtually all the other cast members range from blasé to forgettable? The best side characters for me were actually the robots. I don't know if that's really a good sign, <laughs> if it's a human story. This movie is literally, trying hard not to spoil anything here, literally driven by plot convenience. Not physics, but plot contrivance. From the beginning. While I am fine with this message, it destroys the already messy plot of this pretentious script that tries so hard to fool you into thinking that it is smarter than it actually is. The biggest problem is the last 20 minutes or so, which I cannot talk about. While creative in some ways, it's just downright stupid in others. 2001 worked with these elements because it left the unknown open to interpretation. If you like this movie, that's fine, but like The Dark Knight Rises, until you really start to think about it, eh, it it's okay. Nolan, please, give us another insomnia or something. I give it a B-. Mm. Well, like The Dark Knight Rises, which we talked about on this show not too long ago uh, for a new classic, maybe a second or third watch will um, help me see some of its flaws, because I actually really enjoyed this movie. Nolan very much had some high expectations put on him after the Inception thing, the Dark Knight series, uh, and not to mention easily one of the hottest actors working right now in the starring role with McConaughey. But to me, Interstellar confirmed why he is one of the most well-respected directors out there from fans. Putting aside anything else about the movie for a moment, this is the best directed film on this much of a scale 
by a clear mile. It is gorgeous, even during its Dust Bowl ugliness scenes. The use of silence when applicable, I thought was great. The cinematography on the different planets, breathtaking. You seem to feel that way as well. Couldn't agree more that, that I think Oscar will uh, pay some tribute to that. For the rest of it, it's good and bad. I did not think that it felt it th it's three hours at all. Um, I thought it was the most emotionally charged of Nolan's blockbuster work. Now, I haven't seen a lot of his early movies, so I can't speak to those, but in terms of you know the recent big-budget uh, movies. And I thought the story was both compelling and relatable. Hathaway is good. You're right, Joe. She's really nothing to write home about here. Chastain is very good, maybe not given enough to do, but McConaughey is fantastic here. Coming off his Oscar win for Dallas Buyers Club, it's no real surprise, but it's a little bit of a departure from him. Even in his Dallas Buyers Club character, he still had that, you know, Southern drawl, hey, I'm Matthew McConaughey kind of thing, and you don't get that here. Um, now, the negatives for me were that towards the end, it delves into very hard-to-follow Inception-type territory. Joe said it best. I can't really reveal too much about that, but there it is. Um, there's also way too much scientific talk throughout the movie that it's easy to get lost. You know, there's a lot of reports that the science of the film is accurate. Some say it's not accurate. Either way, it doesn't need to all be explained so scientifically to the audience. And so I got a little lost with that. But uh, I think the movie's a success, and I give it an A-, minus, actually. Which is the same grade I gave The Dark Knight Rises <laughs> upon uh, <laughs> upon its first viewing. But uh, I, I really liked it. I mean, my biggest issues other than that were that the the look of the robots was very primitive and compared to everything else being so scientifically sound i mean in my mind i kind of thought maybe they were trying to distance themselves from prometheus a bit since they already had the sleep chambers and other things that were in prometheus so they wanted to give these robots like a 60s tv show type look it's supposed to be more realistic mm. Like, if there was a robot that could function, it probably wouldn't look like a human being. It'd be a, a box. Okay. It'd be a compatible computer. Right. I mean, I thought that was kind of cool. It's kind of an homage to old-school sci-fi, like, basically the big box. You know? Right. Well, it, was de it definitely made me think of old-school sci-fi. Mm -hmm. But to me, I just thought, well, there's obviously a lot of technology that went into the making of these rockets and everything. I know you haven't seen 2001, but Correct. it just kept feeling like he was basically ripping off. Hopefully, Joe, you can queue up with this. I mean, you can't. You can relate to this. The uh, monoliths from from that movie, mm -hmm. and trying to do an homage to that. I'm sure he meant well with that imitation. Is the sincerest form of flattery and what have you, but to me, it just came off as crass. Well, the problem was, like I said in my review, in Space Odyssey, it's very akin to the room, the the alien room, mm -hmm. the yeah. others. What happens in the end of Interstellar is very similar to that, uh, but whereas in Odyssey, it's left open to interpretation because there's a lot we simply can't explain. Nolan tries to explain a black hole, which is a black hole. So right. I'm not saying it hasn't been played with before, but that that's kind of where it starts to break down. Okay. Well, okay. that went over my head. I, well, <laughs> it, went over it, over over, head. it went over everyone's heads, <laughs> right. I think, because literally there is no way to follow it because I think they were just making stuff up. Mm -hmm. They really were. I mean, they yeah. totally were. They made up. They literally made up their own rules to fix the plot, which is kind of a big problem, mm -hmm. you know, narratively speaking. It's pretty annoying, personally. I thought. I, I, I don't <laughs> Clearly. know. Clearly. Yeah, it's, it also has some of the laziest, laziest character development I've seen this year. The uh, whole thing with Anne Hathaway's character. I, how did you feel? Just random uh, plot point introduced for the sake of shock value. Uh, actually, Dan, how did you feel about the resolution for her character? Because I don't think Justin and I liked that very much. Um, You know, we talk a lot on the show, at least I, I do, about, you know, go big or go home. And I don't think her character was even really developed enough for us to care one way or the other. It's kind of like Charlize Theron and Prometheus. Yeah, actually, mm -hmm. that's a really good example to bring it back to Prometheus. That certainly wasn't one of the parts that hit me emotionally. I'll give you that. Mm -hmm. I didn't really dislike where it went. I just sort of thought it was kind of obvious that at some point something like that was going to probably happen to someone. But I just think it was... I thought they were actually going a different direction that wasn't so cliche. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of did. Right. So I, I think... Well, I guess that's why it was obvious. I, and I'm just saying, like, if they had cut it off, I think right. that, and not gone away with that, I think it would have been better serving the film. Okay. Overall. 
what do you guys think of the runtime? Did did you think that it really felt? Oh yeah, like it was three hours. Yes. Uh, a little, it ran on a little too long. Okay, maybe about twenty minutes too long. Okay. I'd say forty, honestly. Wow, forty, maybe. Yeah. There's there's a lot you can act from that movie and not miss a thing. Hmm. Most of the first act, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I I don't know. I I liked a lot of the stuff. I mean, maybe you could have cut ten or fifteen minutes from from the first hour, but I don't know. I sort of liked getting to know McConaughey and his family, and you know, so that we cared about them later. I suppose so. But did we really need an incredibly drawn out prologue before everything else and try and bring it back with a completely obvious twist? Did you like how he magically found NASA? Well, it was, that's just that's one of the things I'm talking about, Dan. Yeah, that might it, be stupid. It was magic, dude. Uh, all right. Well, some some mixed reaction, and not really surprising. It's uh, you know one of the most divisive Nolan movies uh, of recent years. Uh, but speaking of which, before we continue on, we usually talk about uh, Joe, your Merlin channel, at the end of the show. But um, I just want to put out there that uh, there's a very very interesting uh, Inception uh, <laughs> video that you just posted about the plot holes or the the negatives, let's say, of uh, of Inception that. Uh, our viewers might be interested in. Did you watch that? Yeah, I did. Oh, okay. I watched it this afternoon. Oh, okay. Would it entertain you? Yeah. Good, good. <laughs> I enjoyed it very much. I'm glad. Now you know some of <laughs> my problems. I figured since we were talking about it in Scheller, I'd, uh, I'd throw that out there. Thank you. But uh, yeah, no problem. But up next, uh, Joe, let's let's go back to you, and uh, we're going to talk about Birdman. <clears throat> or as we should call it, Birdman. <laughs> <laughs> Birdman, or The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance, is a black comedy film directed and written by Alejandro Gonzalez in Oratu. It stars Michael Keaton, Edward Norton, Zach Galifianakis, Emma Stone, and Naomi Watts. Basically, all great people. Ringan Thompson, played by Keaton, is a washed-up Hollywood actor who once played the superhero Birdman in three blockbuster films, before leaving the multi-billion dollar franchise. More than 20 years after Birdman, Ringan wants to reinvent his career by writing, directing, and starring in a play, an adaption of the Raymond Carver short story, What We Talk About When We Talk About Love. It's the ultimate midlife crisis, as Riggan sees this play as the last chance to prove his career and life mean something. He also has to contend with keeping his relationship strong with his assistant-slash-daughter, played by Emma Stone, and clashing heads with the pompous theater actor, played by Edward Norton. If that isn't enough, he is literally haunted by his former alter ego, which acts as anything from his conscious to his self-loathing personified. Interestingly, the line between reality and fiction blur, as Riggan seems to show telekinetic powers when he is by himself. Has the legend of his former glory gone to his head, or is the legend more powerful than he originally realized? There is a lot to discuss here. While I have felt that this director's previous work had some promise, I was never fully satisfied with some of his previous films. I think he has truly delivered with this one. This is one of the coolest styles of filmmaking I've seen in years. It's so meticulously edited, with the camera seemingly moving throughout the entire building in this one continuous shot. It's amazing how fluid it is. This adds to the theater-like atmosphere, but doesn't detract form from the tension or the humor. The music seemingly is part of the narrative, hearkening back to films like The Big Lebowski, which implemented this technique. An amazing drum score. But this movie has a story that is so down-to-earth and timely, and yet thematically transcendent in the scope of the human condition. Whether a commentary on the entertainment industry as a whole, or just on the struggle of one man to truly finding, struggling to define himself, this movie covers so much ground. And these characters are so real, and the actors are all so good. The script is tight, and the performers utilize this to the best of their ability. You can tell that all these actors are channeling on personal experience. That's what makes it all the more fun. This is a great movie, and I think it deserves a great deal more attention, and I give it an A+. Well, and you were very, very much looking forward to this for the past few months, so... Yes. Good to hear that uh, lived up to your expectations. I loved it. Um, you know, guys, one of the greatest joys of watching movies is seeing one of your previous favorites who hasn't done anything of note for about a decade just blow a roll out of the water and return not only to form, but elevate what you already loved about them. Eddie Murphy in Dreamgirls is one of the most obvious examples. Joe and I might mention Robin Williams in World's Greatest Dad. But now Michael Keaton will be forever linked to that concept as well. Starring in some of my all-time favorite comedies growing up, other than some fun Pixar work, and an amusing turn as a side character in the comedy The Other Guys, most of Keaton's recent work has been more on the Need for Speed and Robocop 2014 variety. Birdman changes all of this. The buzz surrounding this film is warranted, 
And if Keaton does not score an Oscar nomination, it will easily be one of the biggest Academy oversights in years. This is the role of a lifetime for any actor, and Keaton knows it in every frame of this movie. The film itself is an incredibly well-calculated satire with a razor-sharp wit and mostly engaging characters. It takes a couple of odd turns, and I do wish we either got to spend a little more time with certain characters or have them taken out completely, go big or go home, and there are some instances when the film winks and nods a little too much, but it's easily the best ensemble of the year, and Keaton gives the greatest performance of the year thus far. Birdman is an A. And Joe, I'm glad uh, you mentioned the stylistic nature of the director. Now, I'm not familiar with any of his other work. Babel, 21 Grams. Okay, I didn't see either of those. Naomi Watts, though, 21 Grams, so yep. I see yep. that connection. But I actually thought of you as we were watching it because it has a very Sorkin-esque walk-and-talk feel to it, really throughout the whole movie. Mm-hmm. Something, you know, obviously that Sorkin perfected on TV that uh, that we're now seeing in this. Justin, what do you think of Birdman? Birdman's a film that will make one laugh as well as get frustrated at its fascinating originality. It's a brutally unapologetic dark comedy commentary about the entertainment industry and offers a vast amount of material to discuss well after the film is over. Keaton is at the center of this film and drives the film forward, bearing, and in one case quite literally, all to make the film one of the best pieces of cinema out right now. Given the nature of the story and its protagonist, this could have been, could have easily been devolved into a parody of Keaton's own career, though Birdman goes so much further than mere farce, and that's what makes it so great. The seemingly long take makes the audience feel like a living, breathing entity in the story, following the actions of the whole cast and seeing how they contribute to the narrative. Occasionally, Birdman's forays into magical realism will likely leave people with mixed feelings, but in a story about a man being pushed to the limits of his own sanity to prove that he's more than a has-been actor seems justifiable. It may take time to absorb at first, but Birdman's one of the most brilliantly clever satires in recent years, and I give it an A+. Can either of you guess which characters I was not that enamored with? His, um, uh, affair? I was okay with her. Um, Wife? I thought you could have used her a little more, but yes, Amy Ryan, who I love, mm. um, as the wife character. That's true. Yeah, I mean, honestly, she didn't really need to be in it at all. She's Emma, you, Emma Stone's there. Yeah, like mm-hmm. Emma Stone is there serving that function. So that really is one of the only reasons, you know, I didn't give it an A+. plus. I just thought she was underused and unnecessary. I like, if you're going to use her, have her and Emma Stone maybe be a little different or serve a different function. I don't we, think she took anything away from this story. No. Really. Amy Ryan? I don't think so. Uh, I mean, maybe. I don't know. I, I think everyone else was so delightful. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would have, you know, the, the dynamic between him and Ed Norton and Zach Galifianakis racing around to, you know, get everything, you know, to completion. I, I think any any character we spent more time with would have been better used than Amy Ryan. Even, mm-hmm. even the affair, you know, actress. Okay. Um, and, and I feel like, you're right, Justin, it could have easily been a... Let's talk about how he was Batman, and now he's not. It, but that that would that doesn't even scratch the surface it, of what it, this because it is, is that, but it's a lot more than right, that. Yeah. right. It's not a it's not a completely it's not an accurate incorrect statement. description. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, obviously there's it's, a lot more at work here. Yeah, as, it's only tip of the iceberg. As my mm-hmm. dad would say, it would be like calling Deliverance a movie about a boat trip. Right. Like, right. it's not inaccurate, <laughs> but there's more to it than that. Yeah, um, and, and Birdman really finds a lot in just that sort of basic concept. You know, and it's worth noting that uh, the director actually sought out, uh, like a lot of these actors, as I mentioned, they actually said that one reason why they felt that this film was so strong for them is because a lot of them were playing to their own experiences, their own personalities. Mm. A lot of them were making fun of themselves. Right. Ed, Edward Norton. I was going to say, that oh, yeah. Norton really doesn't surprise like, me. He was, he was like playing up a lot of things he's known for doing, got right. being obnoxious. But it's good that you can admit that at least. Oh, yeah. Put, right. put yourself on the spot. I think you deserve credit. And Michael Keaton was chosen specifically for the Batman role because he felt, the director felt he could relate. Mm-hmm. And for the record, Keaton said as part of the promotion for the movie, that despite what the film might say, it's not exactly that. He actually really does love his Batman role, and he doesn't regret it at all, in right. case there was a misconception. No, he's actually frequently mentioned that 
he couldn't have less in common with the overall attitudes of uh, Reagan yeah, in the film. Yeah, so it's like it's not meant to be perceived that way. Right. It's just kind of an overall look on the career. Because I think we could say that Michael Keaton's not a washed-up actor. He just had, like, his... He had his glory days, and they just kind of pick and chose whatever roles he wanted. Right. You know, whether they're big or not. Like a lot of people. Yeah. You know, I mean, a, a lot of actors who have really early success... I mean, he was in his, you know, 20s when he broke really big, you know, sort of do find that sweet spot you know not everybody's a tom hanks or a tom cruise and just keeps doing blockbusters or after blockbusters but you know a lot of actors are in the same boat of you know they were big once and now not so much but they choose their you know roles a little more carefully they live comfortably enough off of you know residual checks from their former work that they don't need to you know do that that doesn't surprise me at all that he embraces his his batman past I mean, even as we saw in in, uh, Neighbors as sort of a throwaway joke, you know, the younger generation doesn't even really know who Michael Keaton is Uh as Batman, you know, whereas their Batman's Christian Bale. Mm -hmm. And I think that probably helps, too. Like, if he was the only Batman that there ever was, I think he would be much more associated with with the character. The character wouldn't work as well in this one. Exactly. Exactly. It's good. That's a good point, actually. You know? But now, it's actually funny. That was kind of one of the big buzzes, is that this is sort of the... Unofficial the Michael next, Keaton story. It's the next Batman movie, right. so to speak. It, right. It's just interesting. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's an interesting take on it. Yeah, because it's really Definitely. not. It's not, but it it is mm-hmm. in a weird way. It, I don't yeah. know. It's, it's interesting. Up next, uh, this will be one for, for Justin and I. Joe didn't get to see this one. It's Before I Go to Sleep. In it, Nicole Kidman is Christine Lucas, a 40-year-old woman who was attacked 14 years ago. And ever since, she wakes up every day having forgotten everything and thinking she's still in her 20s. A local neurologist, played by Mark Strong, curious for her to remember anything about the attack, gives her a video camera to use daily so she can wake up each day with more and more knowledge about her past. This, however, makes her more suspicious about her husband, Ben, played by Colin Firth, and wondering if she can trust him. This film is brought to us by Clarius Entertainment, whose only other two films are some of my big Fs of 2014, and so it goes, and Legends of Oz. While this movie is not quite at that level, it's anything but a good movie. It has as many pointless jump scares as some bad horror movies. Most of what happens doesn't make much sense, and the solution to the mystery is fairly obvious, at least partially, about a third of the way in. The third time is definitely not the charm for Clarius with this one, but to their credit, it's not another F. It's a D+. Justin? It never ceases to amaze me how in terrible hands, star power can go completely and utterly to waste. Admittedly, both Firth and Kidman have their misfires, and Dan and I weren't entirely blown away by their earlier in 2014 film The Railway Man, but both have proven their acting talent, and with a promising thriller storyline, this could have been at least decent. Instead, as Dan put it, it's yet another pitiful strike in the Clarius portfolio. In roughly 90 minutes, the story is rushed, forced, and not that exciting to watch. Both actors do their best with the material, but with lousy direction, there's only so much that can be salvaged. While I can't put it in the seemingly endless pile of failed movies for this year, it's still a clumsy and lazy addition, and I give it a D. What boggles my mind is, these movies are all bad. Yes. But they also don't make any money. So how is, <laughs> how is Clarius, like... Still able to get star power like Nicole Kidman. Well, I mean, I know Legends of Oz was was crowdfunded, so. Well, that's embarrassing to to anyone that funded it. It's just so bad. I don't. There was no like the mystery element was stupid. Um, Joe, it really was a lot like. Well, Fifty First Dates is the first thing I thought of when she, you know, kept waking up and forgetting. Because, I mean, like, a story like that sounds interesting from what I read about it. I mean, it sounded like it could potentially be cool. And it should have been. It just doesn't work at all. No, and, like, none of it really makes sense. Like, here's what happens, you know. She she goes to the neurologist. He gives her the camera. And then he's like, okay, I'm going to call you every morning and tell you where the camera is. He calls every morning right as Colin Firth leaves. Like, as if he knows exactly, you know, the second to call... And then she believes him every time. She says, oh, okay, right. That makes a lot of sense. I'll go get my camera. It's just... Like, just from the very basic plot points, it just struggled to make sense. I'm glad you missed out on it, Joe. I guess yeah. so. Um, 
Yeah, well, and you still need to actually see their other matchup, the Railway Mound. I am still curious about yeah. that one. That's going to be probably on the list for the wrap-up for the year. Okay. Yeah, That's... I mean, it certainly didn't get raised for me and Justin, but I believe we both gave it a B+. Plus. Just a B. Oh, I'm sorry, a B-. Minus. B-, 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 B. I thought it was a B. I thought it was Bs for both of you. Oh, I gave it a B-, minus, I think. I, well, still. In that B range. Yeah. Based upon, yeah. if you guys gave it decent grades from what it saw, I thought it looked interesting. I, I, yeah. The whole and just based on subject it. matter, I think you would like it. Yeah, probably. Um, whereas this one, I think you can avoid for the ages. Yes. Wow, <laughs> that's yeah. a long no time. No argument there whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with that in mind, let's let's keep it moving here. Uh, our next movie is Laggies, and Justin's going to tell us about it. After panicking over the proposal from her boyfriend, played by Mark Webber, Megan, played by Kira Knightley, decides she's having a quarter-life crisis, which the film seems to think is a thing, and decides she needs to escape from her life. In her escape, she befriends and buys alcohol for Annika, played by Chloe Grace Moretz, and her friends, sleeping over at her house, and running into her single father, played by, great person, Sam Rockwell, who slowly makes her rethink her current situation. I enjoyed director Lynn Shelton's Your Sister's Sister because of its interesting circumstance, realistic sense of humor, and genuine heart. It infuriates me that the same thing could not be said for laggies in which not an ounce of the film could be considered believable. Natalie's character, for the most part, is an annoying woman child who is just not a very likable human being. Her childlike antics border on cartoonish at times, and although I'm sure they were funny on on paper, the film's result is irritating. Granted, she does have a few moments of redemption near the end, but these come way too late in the game, being frequently bogged down by, as I mentioned before, other unrealistic childish antics. Though what keeps the film from F territory is, as I mentioned before, our our great person Sam Rockwell, who almost immediately elevates the film with his presence. Although he has no chemistry with Knightley, and I consider that more her fault than his, he still gets the bulk of the film's few funny lines, and for those, I give Laggies a D. Joe, what did you think of Laggies? My God. (laughs) This movie somehow manages to be both ludicrous, yet somehow blander than tofu. The characters are either unlikable or bland. The plot is either disturbing or unbelievable, depending on your point of view. The actors obviously either don't care or are lacking serious direction, since they are literally sighing their lines out. Even the performers are bored by this. Thankfully, if this movie was tofu, at least we have some soy sauce to balance it out, and that is the greatest of the greats, Sam Rockwell. (laughs) Thank you, sir. The only thing that kept this lifeless piece afloat was his mere presence. His character still makes very little sense, but at least his charisma is still evident. He saved this one. I as well give it a D. Well, who thought that our big discrepancy on the show would be laggies? <laughs> um, uh, a plus from that. I mean, it's, no, it's not an A plus, but um, <laughs> it's no Birdman or Interstellar. But no, I mean, wow. Well, first of all, uh, Justin, the quarter life crisis is a real thing. I mean, NBC even had a sitcom about it a couple years back. But laggies does have a horrible title, which never gets completely explained. Um, I'll, I'll give it that. Um, And it is fairly safe, gets bogged down in a few places with uninteresting side plots, but we see a lot of of coming-of-age films and midlife crisis films, so I think it's actually pretty rare that we see somebody in their late 20s having a coming-of-age crisis. Uh, I know a lot of people that are in this type of a boat, especially with the job market being what it is, etc., etc., and I thought Knightley and director Lynn Shelton captured this very, very well. Now, Justin, I I saw Your Sister's Sister. We saw that together back in the day. I I thought that movie was good, had potential, um, but I actually enjoyed this one more. Now, this may, along with The Equalizer, be a 2014 film that doesn't give Chloe Grace Moretz enough to do. It's not her story, but she still is always delightful to see. And I thought this was a fun role for her, where she's actually playing a character who acts her age, rather than... You know, the 15-year-old who wants to be 30, yeah. like in The Equalizer, that, in fair. Kick-Ass, in if many, I stay. if I stay, in most of her movies. Dark Shadows, even. That's a good point. Yeah, um, I can't argue that one. And, I don't know, I thought actually Keira Knightley was really fun in this movie. Um, I will give you this, Justin, and this isn't something I really thought about until you said it. Her chemistry with Sam Rockwell isn't that great, you're right. But I sort of chalked that up to more that she didn't really know who she was. And I don't mean Knightley didn't understand her character. I mean the character doesn't know who she is. So she comes off maybe a little bit more awkward. 
Um, I don't know. So I, I didn't really hold that against it. Rockwell, obviously, great performer, great performance. I give Laggies a B plus. Wow. Yeah. I, I I had no idea that would be such a divisive <laughs> creature on this week's show. Well, I think for me, I do agree with you that it it's a unique part of life to look at. Mm-hmm. People are always trying to you know struggle with their identity. It continues throughout most of your life. I just the way that this character demonstrated it, I didn't think was believable. Like you could have somebody that's struggling with their identity, but she was literally like a thirty year old person acting like she was 15 it was creepy to me for basically no reason she seemed like she was insane or something i didn't get it i really didn't get it you're not completely wrong about that but i mean from my perspective someone in their mid-30s who most of his friends are below the age of 25 i get it i mean i have a stable job and i own a house i mean i'm well, not in her dan that's the position, difference though but i feel like she was just like the i think she's just a ridiculous extreme Yes. Of that. Like, it's a real thing. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I just think the way it was presented was unbelievable. Like, a lot of the things that occurred in the movie, like, Shim, okay, the whole fact that she's there in the house with these kids, dad finds out about it, okay, bye-bye, off to police. This whole romance thing should never have happened. No. I, I just did not buy that at all. I couldn't buy I it. I feel like it depends on the parent. Sam Rockwell, obviously, is a cool dad. <sighs> in to some this, extent, In this though. character. And... I think it would be more unbelievable if the same thing happened if Keir Knightley was a man. Obviously, you don't want a guy, you know, hanging out with your 16-year-old daughter. Eh, but, I don't know. know, she's a girl. She's a woman. But she's still an adult. Yes. She is. And she snuck in, and I, I don't know, I just, I don't know, something about it bugged me. Okay. I just, I didn't think that would work, personally. And what's, and what's particularly irritating with her is the fact that her situation is not that bad. I'm so. getting I'm getting engaged. Oh, woe is you. All right. Uh, you know, I'll give you this, because we're going to be talking about this characteristic maybe a little bit later in our Oscar movie. Good point. She is engaged, yes. But by who? Her high school sweetheart. And when you're 28 and you've only been with one guy, maybe that freaks you out a little bit. That's an understanding. You know? I guess. And then the next day... You see your dad cheating on your mom. Still not I that think bad, though. Maybe to you. Maybe not for some, Justin. That's a good point. I, it, I can I can easily relate to, to the themes there. But if we're going to play the subjectivity card, every single character that we're looking at on the show could be considered that scenario. That's a good point. Yeah. And so, you know, that was the perspective I looked at it, I guess. My problem with that is, though, like I said, you can apply that to literally every movie. What do you, mean? Um, you mean the perspective of, like, uh, situational? Well, Not necessarily. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that's true. I don't know if Paul... Oh, yeah. I, I can't relate to anybody in Interstellar or Before I Go to Sleep. Uh, Birdman? Not really. Really? I mean... Maybe, like... Uh, I guess they're all actors. Right. Yeah, stuff. I mean, they're all kind of actors and actresses that are... Big. F- kind of famous in that movie. That's a good point. Or his druggy daughter. I don't do drugs. <laughs> so, I mean, I can't... No, I can't really relate to Birdman. It doesn't make the movie less enjoyable for me. As long as they, I loved Birdman. I guess as but... long as they have human traits, you can generally yeah. relate to. Yeah. I, okay, I could relate to Matthew McConaughey and in Interstellar, even though I don't have kids. I mean, the fact that he cared about his family. Sure. Yeah. I That's can, true. I can relate to That's that. That's true. You know, I mean, obviously. So. Yeah, I agree. Too... I agree that it's all subjective. I'm just saying these are my reasons for not really thinking that that was such a problem. If they're trying to create tension, you got to go bigger than just that. All right, maybe Sam Rockwell's character was just a much nicer and more understanding person than most people I know. Because, like, she ends up in jail at one point, mm-hmm. and he basically bails her out. Yeah. And she decides to tell him something right before that. That's true. You're staying in jail, That's woman. true. You, I, but I'm sorry. to be fair, he's also a lawyer, and he's seen a lot of good people do bad things or make that. mistakes. He did say that. You know? I, they didn't really play that aspect up enough. They didn't, but they mentioned say, it a couple of times. They did. You know? I guess. Of all the movies on the show this week, I just never thought Laggies would be the most divisive. The most divisive. Yeah, the most polarizing. Um, all right, well, let's move on now to our home media moment. This is the one Joe feels will be uh, <laughs> the most polarizing, and that is Borgman. So let's see how that uh, how that goes. Let's put it this way. Like, I had a tough job. I had, like, three movies to synopsize, and I had Birdman, Borgman, and Dune. So <laughs> they, they weren't exactly the easiest ones. 
Borgman is a 2013 Dutch thriller film directed by Alex Van Varmerdam. Sure. It stars <laughs> Jean Boiviet, Heidewich Minus, and Jérôme Percival. They're German. I don't know. <laughs> it enters the life of a wealthy family after they encounter a strange wanderer named Camille Borgman. Apparently on the run from the law, he attempts to ask the young couple, Marina and Richard, played by Minus and Percival respectively, if he may use their bath and pretending to be an old friend of Marina's, or a patient rather, says that she was a nurse at one point. Richard proceeds to beat the homeless man severely. Feeling guilty about this, Marina allows Borgman to stay secretly for a while. Turns out this is a big mistake, as he slowly begins to turn Marina against her husband, and through an elaborate series of ruses, including murder, he and other members of his wandering cult slowly begin to insert themselves deeper into the family. Supernatural forces may or may not be involved. This movie is strange. It's also kind of unpleasant. It has a slow buildup and a raw darkness reminiscent of other low-budget thrillers we've seen recently, such as Joe or Blue Ruin. Mm. The performances were good, and each of the actors helped add to the strange, haunting atmosphere. I think this film is a more allegorical explanation of humanity's darker nature, but with a focus on the dismal clash between classes. But honestly, though, that's just my best guess. If the movie isn't taken from a more artistic perspective... It would probably suffer since its pacing starts to get rather noticeable towards the halfway mark. As the film went on, I felt less disturbed and just kind of bored. I also didn't help that basically every character seems to be unlikable, if not despicable. I'm not really sure who I'm supposed to root for. A Borgman, a Borgman and his group may be the hero, in some way, uh, saving the family from themselves, I guess. However, since there is no real explanation for any of his motivations, I suppose it's purposely open to debate. I leave it with a B+. Mm -hmm. Wow, interesting. interesting. Um, yeah, I, I think Borgman is very interesting. It's directed well, acted wonderfully, very weird and very dark. There are some unanswered questions. As you mentioned, we never really get a sense of where this guy comes from. And it takes a, a bit to get going. But unlike you, Joe, I, I can't say that it was boring ever. Um, I do think there are some pacing issues just because it takes a while to get going. But, you know, still, we watch a home media moment every week, and, and some of them come and go without a second thought, or are so generic that I need to ask Justin sometimes, which one was that again? What happened in that? It has faults for sure, but Borgman is one that I won't soon forget. B- minus for me. Hmm. Justin? If we ever do a top five most bizarre films from 2010 to 2014, <laughs> <laughs> Borgman will probably be in the uh, upper tier. That's pretty good. Though that's far from a bad thing. <laughs> It's a strange and twisted thriller with many different interpretations, but it's easily one of the more mem memorable films that I have seen this year, and I am still thinking about it weeks after I watched it. Bayboot's performance as the titular character and potential devil in disguise oozes with creepy charisma, and director Warmerdam lets the atmosphere reflect this in a way that only gets more unsettling as the film goes on. That said, the film's surreal atmosphere works in ways both for and against it. At the start, the film takes on a more of a more direct thriller-esque approach, whereas later it becomes a bit more of a suspenseful character study with some supernatural elements thrown in. Both elements work for the most part, but the lack of balance does throw the film off at times. Though despite this flaw, Borgman's an interesting Dutch film with much to reflect on, and I also give it a B+. Now Joe, I, wa I want to ask you, because I thought actually you were going to go a little bit lower based on oh. the portion of your review that said you found everyone unlikable. And and so I, I wanted to just throw out sort of a general question, because we talked about this last week with Nightcrawler, that there was also nobody really to get behind, but we all gave that positives. What What is it about you know this movie and maybe Nightcrawler that that seems to work for and against in other movies? All right. Because I'm the same way. All right. I think I actually do have an answer for you. Uh, two answers. I think artistically, thematically speaking, I think that's what the movie was going for. Okay. I think these people had to be punished. They're all bad, basically. Mm -hmm. I think Borgman is the hero. And even though he's evil, maybe, as Justin said, he has this charisma. He's fascinating. He's interesting. And I kind of want to see him succeed because I don't know where it's going. And I think okay. with Nightcrawler, it's kind of the same thing. Like, he's, so he's interesting. So you're arguing that he's basically the lesser of two evils. Basically. Like, mm. admittedly... As we discussed in Nightcrawler, yes, Gyllenhaal's character was pretty bad, but everybody was just as bad, if not worse. They just weren't as vocal about it. Mm -hmm. So maybe I gave him credit for stepping up. I can see it. Yeah, I can see it. That's that's interesting. I guess that's my answer. Okay. 
there's a lot of different arguments about what's going on with Borgman. They're all really fascinating if you ever choose to look them up. But, I mean, I, I definitely see where you're coming from in terms of lesser two evils. Borgman's definitely an anti-hero, at minimum. Mm, at best. <laughs> at best, I, I guess it's probably the best. I thought it was pretty cool. But you know what, though? He should have kept the beard. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I thought it, it I thought, I thought I thought when he sh- when he shaved later spoilers I thought it was it, was, it wasn't quite the yeah, same but Borgman. then he couldn't work his way well, into the family see he was a transformation he was first Borgman then he became new Borgman right there new Borgman go. yes Borgman light uh. without the beard <laughs> <laughs> I think what happens is the group takes turns because you notice the other guys were clean cut he wasn't I think it's a revolving mm. scheme uh. oh that's interesting I didn't pick up on that. And the ladies, did I. that's interesting. Yeah. And the ladies are are clearly the cleanup, the right? Cleanup crew, right? Yeah. Right. They're, they're the hit women. Would you have liked more of a backstory on Borgman, or do you like that we didn't know a lot about him? I'll tell you what, I'd like a sequel to Borgman, hmm. or a prequel. Okay, but yeah, I, think, I would like a prequel. But I think you should keep this movie the way it is. Okay, I think it offers an interesting perspective of how do we view this guy, how do we perceive this guy who we don't know anything about yet and where he's going to go. Mm-hmm. And I think it speaks to the overall like thriller-esque agenda that, that the film eventually plays off. Part of mm-hmm. the fun is not knowing. And yeah. that, that's what I think as well. I, I, I thought, you know, yes, the, the, it took a while to get going, but at the same time, the whole time you're wondering, like, okay, who's this dude? What, is, what does he want? I do feel like we're kind of getting the edge of like a different story on like another perspective because at the beginning he's being chased. I just I'm mm-hmm. picturing like the like the big budget Hollywood version of this where it's like the evil Borgman demon versus the preacher guy. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Right. Like I feel like we're getting like yeah. a, a, like the the glimpse of something here. We're not getting the full story. Borgman is directed by Michael Bay. I, I was w- thinking Borgman Borgman equals God's not dead. I was my mind actually went to Van Helsing, okay. but you know, it's somewhere Takes between all there. Kinds. Guess so. The point is, I, many hats. I feel like I just feel like it's a, a different perspective on something that's possibly even done before a lot. Okay, but I, I like the fact they kept a lot open there. So not as divisive though as uh, as you originally thought, Joe. I thought it was going to be. Uh, I don't know. I I wasn't sure what you guys. That were was think definitely about. an interesting one because I definitely did not know how either of you. We're going to think of that. You should have thought it was an A-plus for me. It's weird, right? I figured you would be the highest, yes. But you and Justin were both equal, so... Okay. That was an interesting one. Uh, Good pick, guys. All right, well, let's move into our top five. And uh, we just started this last week. We're counting down the top five in various genres, uh, as it is nearing uh, the end of 2014. The first half of the decade will uh, be coming to a close. And we're going to do Skyfall coming up for our new classic. So, in honor of that, we have our top five action movies, 2010 through 2014. Justin, we're going to start with you. Topping it off at number five, The Raid Redemption. Simple yet intense premise. It's contained yet allows the narrative to develop accordingly and easily some of the best fight sequences ever put on film. And the sequel almost tops it, even though Dan doesn't seem to think so. (laughs) No, it's your list, not mine. (laughs) Well, that's true. Uh, Number four, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Although most consider the third outing to be the best in the series, I felt like this was a I felt this was a more entertaining entry. Do people think that? Yeah, I was gonna say I think on this show we do like the third one a lot. I think most But I think generally the... Ghost Protocol is probably the most popular. But I think so. That's interesting. Yeah. I just like the villain on the third one the most. Well, yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Mostly. <laughs> but I mean, just jaw dropping level stunts, great sense of humor, and the series never really played with that before, and I'm really glad that uh Brad Bird came in to bring some of that in there. He definitely had he definitely still has his Incredibles charm. Number three, Unknown. While taking clearly put Liam Neeson in a new light, I felt like this was definitely the better film. It's an action thriller with a surprisingly good mystery that keeps the audience guessing as to what exactly is going on. And hopefully it never gets a sequel like they did with Taken. My number two, probably much to dance dismay, Hannah. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> I, uh, I was always interested in it, but I've heard mixed things since, mm-hmm. since then. I was not a Sears Shave Ronin fan until this movie. We're going to get to Atonement, and you can hear my rage then, but I'll, I'll save it for that. <laughs> yeah, that'll be an Oscar, eight, is it? Yep. But it took what could have easily been a silly action thriller and gave it this darker and more experimental look that never ceases to draw the viewer in. And I would say it's a very close second to one of the most underrated music scores in recent years. Joe, I definitely recommend it. The music is great in Hannah. Well, Chemical Brothers. Which one do you recommend more, though, Unknown or Hannah? I'm guessing Hannah because it's probably Hannah. Because I think you like Unknown. For you, I would say Hannah, though. I think you would like it. But more Liam Neeson, though. 
Yeah, Liam Neeson's great, but it's also the same <laughs> you know, as every other. Her, I did like Unknown. I'm not disparaging okay. that, that entry on Justin's list, but okay. I think you would enjoy Hannah more. Huh, okay. Uh, all right, well, I will uh, go next. I do have an honorable mention, uh, sort of in the vein of already a brother last week. It's not probably even quite near the top five. It's more like a number eight or nine, but... I can't imagine when else we'll mention it on the show. So my honorable mention is The Adjustment Bureau. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I thought Matt Damon did a great job. And it was the first movie that really made me pay attention to uh, Emily Blunt as well in an action role. Uh, My number five, much to Justin's chagrin, is Salt. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 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 Tit for tat there. (laughs) We're trading barbs at school. (laughs) Yeah, um, I know. Uh, you're not such a fan. I love this movie. Angelina Jolie is easily one of my favorite actresses, and I love her in action roles. Um, Wanted is another one I enjoyed. You know, it's rare that I avoid a movie exclusively for the title. So, <laughs> so dumb. Yeah. I know it's her name, but it's her oh, name. I guess it made everybody salty when they watched oh, it. Yeah. She, was, she was very salty. Um, <laughs> oh, whoa. Here's a movie where I just I was drawn in from the word go. I thought the story was great. Um, so I don't know. That, that's all I could say about Salt. Uh, my number four is a movie that we watched earlier this year, and that is Snowpiercer. Uh, oh, okay. This is a fantastic movie. We've pretty much talked it to death between the review and our Best of Summer show, uh, but I'll reiterate again because it just came out on uh, Netflix Instant. Uh, it really, truly is a great movie with uh, some fantastic performances and some good twists as well. My number three is The Hunger Games. Looking forward to seeing what they do with the the Mockingjay stuff. Um, but this was uh, the first time ever that I had really uh, read a book right before watching the movie. And I enjoyed both pretty much equally. I think uh, the movie took some great twists that uh, the, the book did not do. And I think think it's a great, great starting piece to the uh, franchise. And my number two is a movie we talked about recently on the show as a new classic, and that is Looper. Um, just great performances from uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Bruce Willis. We talked about, you know, a couple of problems with it, but there's another one like Salt that just sort of, you know, didn't know what to expect from it, and it just drew me in right from the start. Very interesting list. My uh, the, only, the only reason Snowpiercer wouldn't have made mine was I was trying to stay straight up action, not necessarily sci-fi. I know Hannah kind of goes a little bit in that direction. Well, maybe a little bit. Actually, Genetically modified. Yeah, assassin. yeah. Uh, okay. Honestly, I was trying to do my list like keeping as close to action as possible, but there are one or two movies that are totally another genre. But There's very few movies that are just straight action. You have very few diehards in movies like Guns, and Nobody's explosions. putting Fast 6 on their, no, on their no, list, no, no. so I mean... Well, we don't know yet. That, yeah. Well, that's number true. That could be Joe's number two. All right, Joe, what's uh, what's your list? Actually, I didn't put it on the list. Uh, I was considering it, though. I know it's one you guys don't like. Uh, my honorable mention is actually White House Down. I thought that movie mm. was awesome. I prefer Olympus. I, Olympus is probably the better movie, but personally, I thought in terms of action, I had a great time with White okay. House Down, so I think it's worth mentioning. Yeah. Uh, number five is a movie we'll be talking about very shortly. It's Skyfall. I think it's an excellent James Bond movie, uh, but uh, we'll talk more about that later. Number four is actually Born Legacy. Uh, I, oh, I, I know yeah, it's, it's, it's a good movie. Kind of a maybe a more a little more of a thriller in some ways, but that last like chase is just so amazing. I mean, I think Jeremy Renner like just truly showed once again how he is just a great monumental force as a lead man. Mm-hmm. I honestly, I, I really enjoyed this. I think it's a good follow up. I hope they continue with more Born movies with him. Hopefully, number three. Uh, is actually the raid two, mm. because I believe that it did. You do like sur- it more than the first one. Yeah. the first one. I mean, uh, I really just some of the best martial arts I've ever seen. I really enjoyed uh, just the, the crazy gangster stuff, but really fun movie. I thought it was excellent. Number two is where I dabble a little more into another genre. That's Django Unchained. I mean, mm. some of the like bloodiest. Justin, Justin asked me about that earlier. I I said it wasn't really action, but that's fine. I mean, it's got like tons of you know gunfights. Yeah, blood. it's one of those. that's, like on it's, the level. It's yeah. adventure western. Yeah. But if I if I had to classify it as more than anything, it's in a, like an action comedy because there's there's a lot of action <laughs> in it. And oh, there's yeah. a lot of comedy. And there's a lot of comedy. So really, it's it's a okay. mixed blend. But really, yeah. just I mean, the the gunfights are great. There's some really great chases and uh, just an all around good movie. You could pretty much argue that most Tarantino movies are Falling in some line. way action, or yeah, at least fall on that line. 
Yeah. You know? Actually. More or less. Most of them, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, Justin, what is your number one? Well, surprise, surprise, number one is Skyfall. It's a testament to the originality Craig has brought to the character, took Bond in new directions, and I honestly hope the next follow-up's a worthy addition. Very good. Uh, my number one, I guess all of these <laughs> sort of fall on that line of sci-fi-ish action. I didn't really think about that, Justin, until you mentioned it, uh, but my number one is Source Code. Oh. Um we, we sort of talked about this uh, when we did our top five train movies. I really, really love this movie. It's engaging. It's It does the, uh, you know, the whole Groundhog Day type thing that we also saw on Edge of Tomorrow done very well. Um, and it, it does it great. It's got a good mystery component to it as well of, you know, who actually, you know, planted the bomb and, and how can we find him. And, and really, at the same time, what is happening to Jill and Hall's character, at least for the first maybe half hour, 40 minutes of the movie. Joe, what's your number one? My number one is one you guys mentioned before, mm. and it's actually Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Nice. Uh, really, this has just got some of the best stunt work I've ever seen, uh, just some of the, the car chases, the sand. Uh, really, a lot of fun. Really, it's it's just got <laughs> virtually no pacing issues. Uh, in terms of pure action, pure fun, I think it's even better than the third one. Uh, really, it's just an amazing movie. I think it. I think it's probably outdone all of its previous ones. Honestly, yeah, I I would agree. I, that's yeah. my favorite. Good list. Uh, next week we will do uh, our top five superhero movies from 2010 on up. Uh, but right now we're going to get into our triple feature of older films on the show, and we kick that off with a movie that was on both of your lists, and that was Skyfall. Justin, you had it at your number one, and uh, let's hear from you first about Skyfall. After James Bond, played by Daniel Craig, is pronounced dead on a mission gone wrong, the head of MI6, M, played by Judy Dench, has her leadership called into question as numerous undercover agents become exposed. Months later, Bond returns to MI6 and is tasked with tracking down Silva, played by Javier Bardem, and finding out why he has been going after M. The reason I consider Skyfall an incredible installment into the Bond franchise is for the very reason many are divided about the film it breaks the conventions people have come to expect about Bond. In the past, these films have been utilized for little more than escapist entertainment, focusing on a seemingly unbeatable man with minimal character development. In Skyfall, that unbeatable agent is gone, and he's completely shaken. Not stirred. <laughs> Couldn't resist, I'm sorry. Not bad. That's good. <laughs> Bond's own personal scars start to come to light as the agency becomes compromised, and for the first time ever, we see him make life-threatening mistakes. Fortunately, director Sam Mendes was ready for this and charges forward with one of the most beautifully shot installments to complement an already suspenseful and original story. However, for all these new directions, Skyfall never compromises the tone of a Bond film, keeping it dark and lively. While Bardem's motives are a bit confusing at times, he continues to show off his acting talent and being one of the more terrifying Bond villains of recent years. Though for these momentary flaws, the film still puts together one of the best conclusions in the franchise, just showing how full of life the franchise still is after over 50 years, and I give it an A. Joe, what do you think of Skyfall? Obviously, <clears throat> you enjoy it. Skyfall is a film for me that I had a lot of anticipation because I didn't see it when it originally came out. So I guess you could say that I'm a little more uh, on the other side of the divisives there. I think that it's really amazing how it has actually taken the franchise to new heights by giving Bond a little more development into his backstory. I think that the, the villain actually is probably one of the more complex. I think Bardem's going to go down as making Silva one of the best Bond villains. Honestly, he's definitely one of the most frightening. I can agree with you there, Justin. And I do think that it is interesting that it breaks conventions by making it a little less escapist, a little less over the top, and making it a little more grittier. It definitely adds to the tension of the film overall. However, I think that it does sacrifice what Bond's generally best known for, and I think that took away from some of the fun for me, personally. Like, it was it was so dark and so serious, where I've always felt Bond's place was to be kind of silly and fun, generally speaking, even the darkest ones. That That is kind of what generally Bond is supposed to be identified as. Despite that, though, I think that it is a really good cap to the 50 years. It's just really, really amazing performances all around from everybody. It does take things to a new direction character-wise. Overall, I give it slightly lower than you, Justin. I'm going to leave it with an A-. minus. Okay. Well, I, I'm the uh, the wide-eyed Bond viewer here. Daniel Craig is the only Bond I've known, um, so I can't compare him to Connery or some of the others. But 
for me, he certainly fits the bill of what I imagine, you know, through the years. Uh, Skyfall is rich with fun action, clever lines, and some surprising drama as well. And it succeeds not only because of this, but also because it plays like a classic action thriller, not one made in 2014. Yeah, there's the massive shootout at the end, but it takes its time setting the stage and laying the story, just peppering in the big action in spurts, unlike something like the Fast and the Furious films or even some of the superhero movies that we see, like The Avengers, where it's almost an assault on the senses so it, it, that it's so action-packed. The other Bond film I've seen is Casino Royale, and though I'm not sure if Skyfall is quite as good as that, I thought it came pretty close. I just lower it one more notch and bring it to a B plus for Skyfall. I do want to clarify, though. I think that Daniel Craig is a great Bond. I oh, think, yeah. I think it potentially he could be the best Bond. Give him, like, two or three more movies, I would say like, it's a very valid argument. Like he's, he's a good runner-up, I think, for Sean Connery. Mm -hmm. Like, he's very different, but, it, like, his level of performance is really, I mean, he's, like, he's well above the league of Moore and Brosnan. No offense to fans of them. But, <laughs> but like, but really, like... Hey, he, what about Lazenby? The one movie he was in. <laughs> well, I, I like Dalton, I guess, but, you know. What, yeah, Dalton. But, you know, the point is... Really, he's just a great performer in everything he's in. I mean, mm -hmm. anything from Layer Cake to Cowboys and Aliens. The guy has range. Yeah. And I mean, I think he's really... Just Dragon come... Tattoo. Yeah, yeah Dragon yeah, Tattoo. Too. And, you know, I think that he just really has solidified himself here with Bond. I have to yeah. agree with you, though, Dan. I actually like Casino Royale a lot better than this one. Yeah, we watched Casino Royale, Justin and I did, uh, about a week before Skyfall came out, because I had never seen any of them. I was kind of curious. And uh, I'd always heard good things. What and your, I, uh... I loved Casino Royale. See, I was kind of curious what uh, your thoughts on it were, Justin, because, uh, I mean... I, I, I guess I'll be honest. I didn't know that uh, the film was as divisive until you said that, because I thought I thought it was pretty critically acclaimed. But for me personally, I think Casino Royale is like one of my favorite Bond movies. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like I said, going into Skyfall, like I think that's one reason why I was a little disappointed by it, because from what I heard, the expectations were really high. Like this is the fifty years. This is mm -hmm. like the biggest best Bond ever. But it also came after Quantum of Solace, so I think people were a little bit hesitant at first. And the th and then because it was so good, I didn't think it was that all that divisive either, to be honest. But I know Quantum of Solace people. Quantum of Solace like. people generally don't like, but I thought it was like. Um, meh. But yeah, I think expectations were mixed going in. I think generally people really do like this movie, though. It, it varies a lot. Of the Bond diehards are not mm. crazy about it because, it, like I said, it does it sort of take, deviates. It's a big yeah, deviation. Okay. It's a huge deviation. From mm. Which is know. one reason I didn't like it as much. I, I kind of was expecting a, a more traditional Bond movie. I mean, not saying Casino Royale necessarily was, but Casino Royale still had like that kind of big, over-the-top sense of fun to it. Like I, I felt like uh, Skyfall ran more like a thriller sometimes than a straight up action movie. I'm not sure if I would call Casino Royale big and over the top. I mean that opening action sequence. That, there is that big opening action <laughs> sequence, but let's, let's jumping, be honest, Joe. jumping across. There. I love that. That was great. Oh, don't get me wrong. The, park, the parkour sequence is awesome. That's great. But let's be honest. The crux of Casino Royale is in the actual casino. It's true. He does play a lot of uh, games. That's that is true. <laughs> there, there's a lot of games. You're right, but still, like when I think of Casino Royale, that's the first thing I think about. Is that just like running across the rooftops? Mm -hmm. And I mean, maybe that's it. But that's a good first impression. I don't know. Skyfall kind of lumbered a bit more. I don't know. It just seemed like a darker, grittier I take. Mean, don't get me wrong. I liked part of the reason I really, really enjoyed Casino Royale, and I promise I'm going to get back to the statement, is because it was so contained. Okay. Because it didn't need, it knew it didn't need to be this gigantic, grandiose Bond thriller. But also at the same time, I think there's a time and a place, and that's really where Skyfall shines. It's not as good as Casino Royale, I'll grant you that, but it definitely holds its merits. I would happily argue it's probably in top in my top five Bond films of all time. Well, obviously, it didn't affect you that much because you did still give it a name minus. That was good, yeah. But but I do want to ask if you didn't have an attachment to the other Bond movies? Because you've seen more Bond movies than anybody on this show. I've seen them all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you didn't have that attachment, how do you think that would have affected what you thought of it? Kind of like looking at it like I'm just like a new Star Trek fan. Mm, just having okay. those new movies to go off of. Right, right. Then I'm sure I would have loved it. Okay. For what it was. I guess it has to be its own thing, but still be part of the same franchise. Mm. Yeah. More or less. I mean, I don't think it has the same level of problems because it's a smarter and better acted and directed movie than the Star New Star Trek films, <laughs> but it's still the same vein, I think. Okay. But yeah, I guess I would probably be less bothered by it if I didn't have as much of an attachment, but right. I can't ignore the fact that I love Bond. 
And and Bond's yeah. generally kind of silly and over the top and ridiculous. It's comic booky, mm-hmm. in all honesty, it is. Well, and Bardem's villain is fairly comic booky. He is, bit, you know. But as Justin pointed out, his motivations are one of the more complex uh, of most Bond villains. I wouldn't hmm. necessarily say all, but he's definitely like in the top three. Oh yeah, you know. Interesting. Uh, all right, well, let's move now to our old classic. Uh, Joe brought for us Dune, and he's going to tell us about it. Dune is a 1984 science fiction film written and directed by David Lynch and based on the novel of the same name. It stars an ensemble cast led by Kyle McLaughlin and including notable actors such as Linda Hunt, Max von Sandow, Patrick Stewart, Dean Stockwell, and of course, rock superstar Sting, (laughs) as they said in the trailer. The film takes place in the far, far future, where the government has become a galactic monarchy and the noble houses fight to gain control of the planet Arrakis, a.k.a. Dune, to gain control of the powerful, reality-warping spice produced there. The story follows Paul Atreides, played by McLaughlin, as he is chosen to fulfill the prophecy of a messiah to free the native people of Arrakis, the Fremen, from the tyranny of the Emperor and the Atreides' archenemies, the Harkonnens. Add in some mutants, a sisterhood of psychic witches, and some trippy Lynchian sequences, you have the cult classic and often divisive Dune. Old classic traditionally comes with a story, well, here is where I explain this one. <laughs> Science fiction has always been a part of my life, even before my birth. My parents met around this time, and this movie came out, and for their own reasons, they found it enjoyable. They would even quote the film. In fact, from what I hear, while my mother was in labor, an effort, in an effort to help ease her through the pain, they chanted the famous Fear is the Mind Killer piece. <laughs> wow. Oh, my word. That's <laughs> awesome. Whether or not this is true, I don't know, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it's true. Regardless, this movie was, you know, had a great deal of influence on me when I was young, and I was fascinated by it. The world was so interesting and so captivatingly bizarre and strange, and this was long before I knew who David Lynch was, who would eventually become one of my favorite directors. Eventually, I checked out the original books and even the miniseries that Sci-Fi did, and since then I've just loved the Dune franchise. And the key elements are present in the film. Though it does take a few liberties, uh, the wielding module specifically, it is mostly a faithful adaption despite the troubled production history. It still has grand ideas, an epic score, cool effects, and set pieces, and some of the most quotable dialogue ever. The performances are good, though some are certainly over the top. Now, I will admit that this film and perhaps the Dune franchise itself are not for everyone. Some things are problematic. The film throws a great deal of information at you, forcing you to pay attention. There are some key elements I wish the film had added from the book to give some events more weight. I believe that Dune does have both style and substance. It just struggled to condense such a complicated novel into the format that it could be accessible to everyone. In truth, this film is only really for hardcore sci-fi fans or hardcore Lynch fans. I just happen to be both. (laughs) I give it a B+. Nice. Well, Joe, now I've seen some of David Lynch's work. I can can say that. Um, But... Uh, you know, it's funny, the, the opening uh, part of my review is sort of how you ended yours. I, I think this film is an example of super non-mainstream sci-fi. <laughs> um, you know, the story is good, but I think pretty inaccessible mm-hmm. to a more casual sci-fi fan. I agree. Which I would probably consider myself. It, it's completely <laughs> over the top and bizarre <laughs> uh, and a little bit hard to follow at times. The computer graphics are pretty good. Um, not amazing, I think, for the time, but pretty good. Um, but I'd say the worst of all for me was the incessant inner monologuing from almost every character. Mm-hmm. I liked the narration stuff from Virginia Madsen. I wish they would have maybe kept with that mm-hmm. and not so much with the inner monologuing. And I love seeing Sting, of course, one of my favorite <laughs> musicians of all time. Met him in person, great guy. Um, you but, met him in person? Yeah, I went backstage at one of his concerts. That's awesome. Yeah, it was very, very nice. Cool. He, he just like woken up from a nap. But, um, but his like, quote-unquote mean face... Is so like ridiculous. <laughs> I will kill him. You know, it's too much. Um, but but through it all, I do have to say it's fun in a completely campy way. Thank you. Um, but it's not a good movie. <laughs> uh, but it's a C minus for me. Okay, Justin, what'd you think? I'm not sorry I watched it. That's for sure. That's good. When I learned last year that this was one of Joe's favorite movies, particularly knowing the film's reputation, I asked him to lend me his copy. After I gave it back to him, he asked. He asked me if I thought it was deserving of the flack it received. My response was generally along the lines of, it had problems, but I still think it would have been far worse without Lynch's involvement. On the second viewing, I feel that that point is all the more tenable. 
Admittedly, the acting's still fairly hit or miss, and the storyline goes in a number of disturbing directions, though it's hard to say whether or not this is because of Lynch's work or of the dry and surreal source material. That said, after two viewings, I'm, s I'm still not entirely sure if it's an improvement, though I will say it definitely becomes easier to follow and slightly more entertaining the second time around, and I give it a C. Okay, mm. I can live with that. Well, it's certainly one of the greatest old classic stories I've heard. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's good, Joe. <laughs> it's well, very cool. Well, I know that it's a very, like, divisive movie, mm -hmm. and it's like, it's, uh, it's, it's like a very narrow audience. Yeah, so well, I, I, know, I, I know it's one of Ebert's uh, least favorites. Uh, yes, it which is. Which maybe is why... Remember, didn't they focus a little bit on him and Lynch in the, uh, that biopic? Well, that goes... Briefly. That goes well right? beyond... It was at the end, it was... It was one of the things... Because I know that really made you angry. Because, it, well, it's because, you know, they decided to do it at the end of his... Before he died, <laughs> I know, which like I thought last, was stupid. The last two days of his that, life, they talk about that in the that film. That was stupid. Well, that goes well beyond um, Dune. Uh, actually, Ebert kind of had this thing against Lynch for a long time. He just... Everybody loved his movies. He hated all his movies. Okay. Until the last couple, which he really uh, loved. okay. But, I don't know. It's, it's just... There's a lot more than that. Dune was just the first one he actually... Uh, no, he didn't even really like Elephant Man. I don't know. He, no, no, but um, I guess he just didn't like uh, Lynch's style for a long time. Uh, one of the reasons the movie didn't do so well is uh, actually because they didn't screen it for critics. Uh, so there was actually oh. like this uh, kind of ambivalence With towards stigma. it before it came in. So everyone's expecting it to be right. bad. So I always felt that it probably got a little harsher of a delivery than it did. I mean, it definitely has problems. I mean, mm, I can't yeah. deny that, but... Uh, really, I, I think w when I was looking uh, up research for this movie, I was thinking, like, really, it was interesting because, like, a lot of critics disliked it. But if you go on to IMDb or anything, it's all positives. Right. And it's all from people that, like, love Dune and the franchise. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's like I said, it, I think it works best either as an introduction or... Like, to get you to look into the rest of it. Yeah. Or if you're a really hardcore fan, you'll be like, oh, this is cool, like how they put this here. That's kind of cool. Because, uh, uh, interestingly, even though it does take some liberties, most fans of the books don't hate the Lynch version, mm. which I, I've always found interesting. Okay. Maybe because it was a big foray. Uh, I don't know. I, I, it just, I think it's really interesting uh, because it's basically like if you're hardcore into it, You'll love it, I guess. Right. And if you're interested in the universe, this will at least give you an idea. But really, mm. unless you know a lot about Dune, it's going to be hard to swallow. Right, which I knew nothing, of course. Which is fine. <laughs> but the thing is, though, uh, I think for a lot of people, though, that maybe don't like Dune at all, mm. this movie has actually surpassed that. Hmm. Be and, hmm. I think, and I actually believe that's why it survived as a cult classic, because... Of the campiness. Right. Because... Yeah, even exactly. that I can definitely, yeah. Because it's it. so epic. It's so amazingly silly mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Like, despite its problems, it's kind of hard to forget. I mean, I will maintain, it's got some great lines. Yeah, there are some... I could see how, you know, your parents would be able to quote it and, you know... And I mean, it's, it's a combination of, like, the big ideas and the hokiness, I think. It's mm -hmm. just kind of like a perfect blend. So I know that my parents are big into Dune and... Right. Uh, so I am into Dune. Yeah, makes sense. How how do you think it is as a foray into Lynch's other work? Don't judge his other work based on this one. I mean, um, well, okay, let me They're all different, you. but like that's the great thing about Lynch is that he has stylistic components that you can see in all his movies. Mm -hmm. But no one Lynch movie is exactly the same. Okay, like this is his only foray into science fiction. Uh, I guess that's true. And it's actually one of his few straightforward movies. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, well, how did you feel about the weird dream sequence and stuff? Stuff didn't love them <laughs> because that's to be honest, that was the most Lynchy it got. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, that that would seem bizarre and out of place with everything else. If you if it makes it you feel any better, he actually wanted more artistic control, and mm. they one of the yeah, reasons they sort of reined it in. One of the reasons it resulted being a lot of things not making sense, and why there's a four hour cut that he doesn't have his name attached to. Right, it was a. A big trouble production history. They wouldn't give him the final director's cut. They did. They denied him the right. Wow. So, he, this is the one movie he doesn't like to talk about. Okay. So this Ever. is this is like probably his worst movie, and mm. I still love it. Interesting. So okay. you know, well, actually, I stand correct. His worst movie is definitely Firewalk with Me. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know that's that's a different story. Well, yeah. Uh, well, our final movie of the show is our Oscar A to Z, and that is Anna. And the King of Siam. This is the 1946 film nominated for Supporting Actress for Gail Sonnegard and Score. 
and it won for cinematography and art direction. Directed by John Cromwell, this is an adaptation of the novel, which is in turn based on the life of Anna Leon Owens, and was later turned into the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical The King and I. In the film, Irene Dunn plays Anna, who in 1862 comes to Bangkok with her son Louis to tutor the king's many children. The king, played here by Rex Harrison, is enamored by her and asks her to instruct his many wives in English as well as teaching his dozens of children. The two spar back and forth about politics, culture, and feminism, but are also drawn to each other. The best part about Anna and the King of Siam is what it won its Oscars for, the cinematography and art direction. The sets and costumes are beautiful on a grand scale. The acting is also very good here by the two leads and some of the others, though the acting of a lot of the children is pretty lacking. The biggest problem I have with the movie, though, is that Anna is just not that sympathetic a character. Something we briefly mentioned in Laggies was a problem for you gentlemen with Keira Knightley. I haven't seen The King and I, but as we were watching this movie, Joe mentioned that they changed that for the musical, so maybe you can speak a little bit to that, Joe. Oh, believe me. I, I <laughs> but I just I had a hard time really getting behind Anna's plight. For me, the movie gets a B. Joe, let's go to you next, then. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a bit of history with this one. Uh, Anna and the King of Siam, you know, I've always liked this story, and I enjoyed both the 50s musical with Yul Brenner, and I actually really enjoyed the 90s interpretation with Jodie Foster. So I've seen two other versions of this story, and uh, it is it is interesting. They actually do kind of leave out the most compelling thing about her backstory, that her husband died, and that's why she's struggling to make so much money. She takes this job. She yeah, they don't talk about that at all. She doesn't want to go to this place. It's a struggle for her. You know, she's trying to raise her son on her own. I think both films do a much better job explaining that. Mm. Uh, this is the earliest version of the story I've seen, and I have to say that it is amazing how close the versions really are for the most part. Uh, some focus more on some aspects more than others. Brenner's focus more on the grandeur of the two cultures clashing, while Foster's version focused more on the historical backdrop. Uh, this one is kind of a fusion between the two. Hmm. Uh, the chemistry between the two leads is great, as in the more recent films, and the set pieces and costumes are as great as ever, uh, as you said, Dan, so it's something that I think is consistent with all of them. Yeah. It also doesn't shy away from the darker parts of the story involving Tup Tim. Uh, I see this film as a template for the other ones, honestly. It certainly was something to live up to, but I believe both the other films are superior, uh, mostly due to one major factor, Anna is simply not as likable as she could be. She comes off as rather pampered and ungrateful. Uh, Deborah Kerr made her seem strong-willed due to her husband's death and amplifying her stubbornness with the king, and Foster's made her seem simply like a stranger in a strange land who didn't understand what was going on. It's hard not to compare these other films, but the one that stands out here is still fairly strong on its own, and Rex isn't Brenner, but he may be better than Chow. I actually give it an A minus. Mm, nice. Yeah, Rex Harrison does a great job. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. He acting wise, I think he's he's the best in this movie. Justin, what do you think? It's a bit odd reviewing this after so many interpretations have been made from the classic musical from 1956 to the divisive drama from 1999 and the animated musical that we don't talk about. Yeah, I didn't mention that one. <laughs> That said, this was the first one ever made, and the first I have seen in its entirety, so hopefully this review is with minimal bias. That said, I have to give the filmmakers credit for truly taking on a project of this magnitude with some truly impressive sets and cinematography. Despite the offensive use of yellow face, whether or not that is justified from the time period is debatable debatable at best, the (laughs) cast does an adequate job in their roles and keeps the fairly long film moving at a steady pace. Though near the end, the film takes a turn for the darker, which contrasts the optimistic nature of the story earlier on. At the end of the second act, the film seems to focus on the on the cruelty of the king and the political issues that follow. Although I admire the filmmakers trying to add dimensionality to their storyline, it still throws off the balance already established by the actors. While it's certainly not without its flaws, or darkness, and in The King of Siam is an entertaining first adaptation of the novel, and I give it a B. Yeah, it's funny. Ro- the King and I is one of the few Rodgers and Hammersteins I actually have not seen. It's just weird. It is weird, and I don't know why that is. It's just never on at my house growing up. We were huge Sound of Music fans, obviously, Oklahoma. Um, but that's one that I, I just didn't get to see. That's really good. I mean, obviously. Would you say that's the best of, of the three that you've seen? Uh, maybe. I've always liked Dan and the King, though, the best. Sure. I, I remember that was in your top five Jodie Foster uh, yeah. performances. films. Yeah, Forms. performances, yeah. Yeah, I, I really liked it. Um, apparently that one's divisive, but uh, it definitely does things better than this one did with her character at the very least. I mean, mm-hmm. I thought it was pretty negative, but I was looking it up while I was preparing this review, and it, it's it, it's very mixed. There's a lot of people who love it, like you, Joe, and there are a lot of people who are like, this is not good. Uh, 
I mean, I can understand why, uh, but I'll probably run it sometime. I think you should see The King and I, obviously, more because right. it's more iconic. Like, I think the music is great and Brenner's great, uh, but the problem with it being Roger and Hammerstein is that uh, really the Harrison version and the Foster version, or the Italian fat, I guess you should say, the difference between those two and this one is that, like, it, it does go into a darker territory, but with the, the King and I, because it's Roger and Hammerstein, they. They can't really go into like the whole the really beating darkness, and death right. and execution. Right. It's kind of like, oh, I won't spoil it, but it's just kind of like, <laughs> yeah, mm, I don't know. I know yeah. it's a different type of movie, but you've seen grittier, and so it, it's sure. different. They're different. They're all different, but they all follow the story the exact same way. So it's really interesting to see mm. comparably. Yeah. Well, and this just came out two years after the novel was written, so I mean, oh, it was it was a Whoa. fresh story, freshest to death at the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, which I guess maybe is why the others have leaned so closely to it because obviously, like I said, probably got a lot right. It seems like a template because if mm-hmm. you watch King and I, you watch Anna the King. It's the same scenes, almost the same lines, like just dialogue line by line. It's almost exactly the same. They've got the same motions. Head can't be higher than mine, <laughs> wow. et cetera, et cetera. That is good. Like, that's like, a good like, quote. Like, that's just that's really good. I think Harrison's done it the best though, because uh, Renner doesn't do it as much. Okay. And, and Shy and Fat kind of, kind of like joked about it because they didn't play it up because they weren't trying to be quite as. Oh, uh, they didn't want to be as like you're right. He, he was just like, duh, blah blah blah, etc. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's not as fun. It's not as no, fun, but no. it was you know it was just like ah, uh, etc. Like you know you know the Shy and Fat face stuff. Yeah. Kind of like that. <laughs> like whoa. But, you know. Uh, all right. Well, at some point, uh, Joe, maybe we'll watch that uh, Jodie Foster version. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, that is going to do it for the show this week. You can uh, follow us on Facebook, Film Fanatics with an exclamation point, uh, and you can check out our five-word reviews there. We will have our uh, listener's choice slot coming up again uh, very soon, so please uh, get your requests in for that. You can do that on the Facebook group or uh, on this YouTube channel as well. Uh, We also continue to get subscribers, so uh, if you have not subscribed yet, uh, go ahead and do that. We'd love to have you aboard. Uh, Joe? Other than uh, the great Inception uh, uh, little <laughs> video you did uh, earlier, uh, what else can we expect on your channel? Well, I did a video on the Hulk recently. I did another video on Full Metal Alchemist. I'll uh, probably be doing one on sexuality and anime, and oh, interesting. Uh, which would be should be interesting. And uh, we also recently uploaded a video just talking about some new comic book issues. Okay. Specifically the uh, uh, the rape of Batman. That's kind of been. Hmm. Uh, shelved. It happened back in the late 80s, early okay. 90s, and kind of resulted in a big story event, uh, creating a character that's really hated. But we just had to talk about that because, really, it's kind of an issue people should be talking about. Right. That's really. very interesting. I it didn't is. know that. Yeah, it, yeah, it cool. happened. Uh, all right, and you can link to that uh, in the description of our page, or our video right here, uh, and our Twitter feed, at Film Fanatics Pod. That's going to do it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. Bye!